Thank you for being here, finally. Uh, we've been trying to do this thing together for many, many years, and we were stopped by COVID and uh, different releases date for the film. Um, so the first uh, thing I wanted to ask uh, for this film, which is, I'm sorry, I call it a sequel. It's not a sequel, it's a continuity of uh, Dune, um, but you obviously shot it in, in two parts. Um, and I was wondering how you managed to turn uh, the break in between two films into such an advantage for shooting this as a different film, and if you had difficulty thinking about continuity or since it's it's one film cut in two in a way yeah the thing is that my dream at first was uh, when i came with the idea to at, uh, to legendary to, to to do two movies my desire initial idea was to shoot both movies at the same time and uh, which uh, the studio didn't agree with because uh, um, of the cost uh, uh, that uh, they wanted to do a first movie and see where it was going and um, I agreed with that. I thought it was like there was something kind of honest about the idea of, okay, let's try, and, and if the, the first movie is uh, well received, or, or, um, then we will go on. And um, that, uh, um, it happened that it was the best thing that ever happened, that I, I didn't shoot them uh, together. Um, it was the first time in my career that I had the chance to revisit uh, uh, a space, characters, and uh, there's something quite um, rewarding uh, for a film director when you f do a first movie and you see all the mistakes you've done and then you can go back and, and, and uh, improve yourself. And, uh, and I learned uh, it's a, both movies were uh, pretty challenging, but the f second one was definitely more, much more of a, there was like technically it was like the most complicated thing uh, I've ever done. And I think I can speak for my old crew. And um, it, uh, we were able to do so because let's say that we, at one point, we realized that part one was a kind of major rehearsal to do part two. It was really like we learned so much and the research of the, and development for visual effects and uh, uh, for uh, uh, the, the design and everything. It, 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 there was like, it was like part one was really like a, a, um, template and, and, and yeah, so we definitely um, were able to bring part two where I wanted it to be because of uh, we had all this knowledge coming out of part one. So d technically, did you learn a lot of new skills uh, when you were doing this or you just worked in the same way? No, I learned a lot, and it was like, um, it w there, there was things like uh, I'm someone that is, um, I will say kind of a traditional, meaning that I love to work with one camera, one thing at a time. I'm not, I don't like to work with multiple cameras. I, um, and on this one, I was still working with one camera on my unit, but I had to supervise other units at the same time in order to, to be able to bring to the light what I, was want, I wanted to do, because there's a, a lot of scenes that uh, required a long period of time to shoot. And for that, I had to multiply myself with the help of a lot of, a lot of people, of course. Um, yeah, we saw the credits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't want to go out of order here, but it seems like it could be another Dune coming after this, considering the way the movie ends. Um, first of all, if you kill Zendaya, you cannot come back here. <laughs> <laughs> We would be very upset. I'm warned. <laughs> <laughs> and, but also they'll give you opportunities to learn a lot of uh, new technical skills also uh, if you take another break for a couple of years, maybe. <laughs> no, but uh, there was no break between both movies and those movies are pretty long to, to do. Yeah. And uh, uh, because of the, the, all the pre-production, the, the, the world development, and uh, um, even if part two, we, the pre-production was quite uh, intense, it's always the post-production that it, uh, it's always like a minimum a year of work to, 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 to do all the VFX and the work. And uh, so if, if I, um, even if I start part three tomorrow morning, we'll still see each other in a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
depending what happened to the characters. Yeah, so exactly. just <laughs> one. <laughs> Um, it's something I mentioned earlier, uh, what was the great thing in doing this retrospective and having you here was also the fact that you gave us a carte blanche of films that were in you, films that influenced you as a filmmaker or as, as a film cinema goer. Uh, and it was really fun because we did ask a list of like maybe six films and we got 160 titles <laughs> to work with, <wheels, laughs> uh, which showed your wide range of, uh, uh, of films that you love and work for. But you also gave us a quote that was, I felt was really interesting and very original in the way that it's not just film that influenced you, it's also the way you worked within yourself to separate yourself from the influence that you've received in watching a film to create your own, um, your own vision, really. And I was wondering if it's something you could elaborate a little bit on, because it's easy to pick films that make an impact on when you see it, and maybe not reproduce, but it stays in you, but how do you separate what you've seen to create something that's original, and you have your own cinematic language, and whatever you're making now, nobody can say you're copying from someone else. It's just like, it's your own language of cinema. I, uh, when I was a film student and uh, for many years, uh, I felt like a ball in a pinball machine. Like every time I was watching a movie, you know, it was like multiple influences. And, and uh, of course, I'm a, I'm a, uh, before being a filmmaker, I'm a cinephile. I, 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 I absolutely love uh, uh, watching movies uh, as much as I can. And, and uh, I feel that uh, uh, it's a never-ending pool of, of uh, uh, there's eras of, of uh, the cinema history that I feel embarrassed that I could not talk right now about because I, there's so much more uh, to, to learn all the time. And it took me um, a while as a filmmaker to finally feel uh, that I was in a zone where I, I was shooting uh, uh, and it, that it was coming uh, outside myself without having trying to find a space where I felt that the vo outside voices were not too loud. Um, it, it, I think the first time I felt that was what my fourth feature film, Incendie, where I felt that I was finally home. Before that, I felt that it was like uh, there was too many people talking in my head. <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, it's like to say that I can um, shut the door completely and, and uh, of course I'm the product of multiple influences but uh, uh, I try as much as I can to um, approach reality with a camera like if I was the first one doing it otherwise it's too uh, castrating can we say in English I don't know is the word castri <laughs> castra uh, <laughs> it means that um, it uh, you understand okay okay <laughs> Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, uh, um, the idea. Is, that's why I I know a lot of directors love to share movies with their crew yeah. before to guide them. Me, I do the I try to do the opposite. I try really to uh, to remove to go away from any cinematic references and go more into documentary photography or painting or music or to trying to find different ways to. Um, bring images to the surface, yeah. I, I was thinking about the movie that wasn't on your list, but it was Baltol of Algier, mm -hmm. um, because obviously there's um, all the, the battle scene, but also a lot about the topics in terms of resistance and guerrilla resistance and the colonialism and fighting against imperialism. And, but I guess you couldn't share it with your crew because we were not allowed to watch movies. <laughs> Um, but the thing is that uh, it's uh, the, the the Dune is uh, um, as through the years the book became more and more relevant. Um, it was written in the 60s, and uh, as you all know, and then it's uh, the more time passed by, the, wor the the worse it gets. I think <laughs> so. It's like the book is more and more relevant, and um, uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, it's nearly a documentary of <laughs> current times, uh, in a way. <laughs> But it's it's uh, there's topics in it that I'm really fascinated by. 
Um, one of them is the alienation of religion, where uh, it it um, I feel that's where it's uh, for me. It's a, it's a, the influence mostly is um, coming from from home, where um, before the '60s, where I come from, uh, religion and politics were blended. The church had tremendous power over uh, the population in Quebec until there was something called the Quiet Revolution in the 60s where there's a artists and intellectuals that there was a movement that uh, decided to separate church and politics in order to peep to, because politics is about, politics is about nuances and compromise and, and trying to find solution together instead of the absolute and the black and white of a go to hell or to paradise. It's like, uh, so there was something there that uh, I think that I was, touched by as, as a filmmaker. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the comments about organized religion and, and prophecy and the false messiah or real messiah, it's, it's quite strong, but it's also, also very relevant about, about what we can, we can see today. Um, the, the, um, when Frank Herbert um, wrote Dune, when the book came out, he was disappointed uh, how uh, the readers uh, he, f he felt that the readers misunderstood him, that uh, uh, people saw into Dune the celebration of a, of a hero, of Paul Atreides. And for him, he wanted the movie, the, sorry, he wanted the book to be uh, uh, a warning, a cautionary tale regarding messianic figures. And uh, uh, in order to correct that, that perception, he wrote a, a tiny book called Dune Messiah that is almost like an epilogue to try to correct uh, the perception and uh, me knowing that I did my adaptation, uh, not trying to be faithful to the, specifically part two, I was not trying to be faithful to the book, but more faithful to Frank Herbert's initial desires. So uh, in order to do so, the big difference, I will say, is the character of Shani. Shani in the book, in the second part, kind of disappeared into in the Paul shadows, you know, he's, he, she's a believer, she, and the character becomes less interesting. And I thought that uh, there was a very strong opportunity there to create a character that will give us a new perspective on Paul. And uh, in order to get closer to Frank Herbert's uh, initial desires. I mean, I also love the way you bring like female character um, to the forefront, even so it's, could be seen as a mostly male uh, environment, and the women are in the background and they come, come for they're the strongest character, but they don't, they cannot show their power in the same way. Mm -hmm. And it's also something that you make in a very modern way and a very contemporary way. Yeah, the, the book is a, a set in a feudal, feudal uh, uh, political system patriarchal in some, uh, but uh, the, the real power is held by the Bene Gesserit sisters. And uh, when Eric Roth uh, tackled at first the, the, the adaptation of the, the first movie, he asked me, is it, uh, what would be the key to open the book? How can I crack that? Can you have at least one word? And I said women. The idea of using to, to uh, make an, uh, an, uh, an adaptation that will be focused on the Bene Gesserit sisters. Well, for, for those who know, who know the book, it's a, the book is very dense. There's a lot of faction, a lot of uh, different school of school of thought in the book. There's like a, and 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 uh, it gets quickly complicated. And I I really made this adaptation focusing on that angle, which uh, I thought was very uh, the most relevant and uh, inspiring. And uh, it meant also that, again, yes, it was uh, putting uh, uh, more, folk, more a spotlight on, on, that, on the sisterhood and, uh, and the power of women. That is kind of, uh, uh, yeah, fascinating for me. Well, we have amazing costumes. Um, you know, so. I, I thought the way they are, like, the design and the dress is, is, is quite extraordinary. Yeah, Jacqueline did a fantastic work. I remember when I was doing storyboards, I asked my storyboard artist for the Reverend Mother. It was just a Sharpie, of, a black Sharpie line. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Reverend Mother every time in the storyboards. And, and uh, that was by reference for, for Jacqueline. <laughs> well, luckily, you, have, you had a good, a good, uh, good 
good help for that. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask a little bit about when you work on a film, what are the first things that comes to your process? Uh, because you, you write, uh, you, you write also, you adapt, but do you think more about sounds and the design of the sound or more about uh, the script or more about the visual aspect? Why, how do you construct your universe when you first have an idea about a film? That's a tough one. We're going to be here for six hours. No, 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 but uh, it's, it's uh, first of all, I, uh, I absolutely, I, I came to movies through the words. I love writing. I don't consider myself necessarily a good screenwriter, but I love writing. I love, I love, and, and it's like, uh, and uh, I love also to, I developed through the years more the idea of collaborating to, to work with other screenwriters. And uh, uh, I love sharing creativity. And uh, uh, so the, I, well, let's say that to adapt these, these movies, the, the screenwriting process is quite long because it, the, the books are pretty dense. And, um, but once the, the screenplay is, uh, is uh, done, the, I will say what is maybe more specific to my approach is the storyboards, where I will uh, draw alone with uh, my storyboard artist the whole movie, where I, that helped me tremendously to uh, um, dig into, to, to, to um, sculpt the movie, to, to find the, vocab the cinematic vocabulary that, uh, to apply that vocabulary to, to the old structure and to um, create props, costumes, uh, uh, vehicles, uh, uh, not thinking that I will necessarily come with the final idea, but at least that I will find ideas to feed my crew later and, and uh, there's a lot of uh, things that are the ideas that are coming out of this, and more importantly, idea of mise en scène, where I will uh, very often find uh, the proper way to shoot, and uh, going through the words to the image. There will uh, uh, there's always a, a certain amount of serious transformation that goes into that process, where I will go from the storyboards and rewrite the screenplay after from the storyboards. Um, that's because I because feel because the sharpie is not good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> but but it it really uh, helped me inform me to um, the, that's where I feel the really the movie is born, and uh, as I say to my crew, um, the the storyboard supersedes the the screenplay, and then nature supersedes the storyboard. Meaning that when we go on set, if something happened with the actors or with the light or with a natural event that feels absolutely inspiring. I will just throw the storyboards uh, uh, above my shoulder and, and uh, improvise. Yeah. I mean, composition and, and mise-en-scene is very strong in your work, and, and you can see it here. But in re-watching some of the Carte Blanche movies that you, you shared with us, and I was thinking particularly about Kurosawa and Seven Samurai, mm -hmm. um, I, it did remind me of like, the how precise the composition is in your imagery as well, and I was also that's why I was curious to see at what point you're thinking about mise en scène, cinematographic composition, and what time you bring the sound into it, because also you have a very, very strong collaboration with Hans Zimmer and and how the sound is constructed and bring and and brought on on the the screen. So when you have you're done with a storyboarding, the composition, like, what do you do with uh, uh, bringing the sound design and the music and uh, the soundtrack? First, first I try to, to uh, make sure that, uh, that to write, uh, uh, when I, I write the screenplay, I try uh, uh, to incorporate as much uh, sound ideas as I can, to, to try to, to construct, the, the, to think about the sound in this writing process. Then I work with, uh, 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 an editor, my uh, uh, editor, Joe Walker. Uh, Joe was uh, uh, a composer, was was uh, uh, studied as a composer, then became a sound editor for the for the BBC. So it's really someone that came from sound uh, design and, and music. So when we cut together, when uh, Joe cut, he he cut uh, as much sound than music uh, than uh, image. I mean some. Uh, 
editor will, will work on the cut exclusively the image and then the sound designer will come after. But with Joe, we create a template, like a blueprint of the skeleton of the sound in the editing room that will, will feed the, the sound crew after. So it's less sound is really uh, embedded in the, the, the design of the, in the structure of the movie. The, um, when I was like working on indie movies, um, I suffered uh, because I, I, I was suffering because I was feeling that the sound was coming too late in the process, and and uh, it's more a thing like an that addition to what you found at the last minute. Yeah, that, that we, you think for years about the, uh, everything, and the sound was coming just uh, very late in the process, and uh, I felt frustrated for that uh, about that. So that's the thing I love. One of the, one of the thing I love working in Hollywood. It's like you can afford certain things, and then you can afford to have a sound designer that come very early in the process that can feed Joe with, with sound. Those sounds would get mature, will have deep roots in, 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 in the movie. And, and uh, I will have, it's not things that will arrive at the last minute. You know, it's like it, there's something I would be, have the chance to work as much on the sound than on the images and the VFX. And that slow, uh, and Hans also will be informed about the sound early on. And, and uh, um, when you work with someone like Hans Zimmer, uh, say Hans is, uh, can uh, can be uh, bold. He can uh, take a <laughs> and uh, as Joe says, it's the, the Panzer division that lands on, <laughs> on the soundtrack. <laughs> and 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 it's like uh, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of things that you can put in in, in, the, in the sound spectrum, and Hans is taking a lot of it. So it's like uh, 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 you have to balance, there's a dance that needs to operate and a collaboration between the, the sound designers uh, in this year, Richard King and Hans that are friends and work a lot together and, uh, and, and are used to work together. So to, to make sure that uh, there's like space for both. So it, yeah, it's, it's uh, and Hans loves to go very close to the frontier between music and sound design. And uh, I love that. And, and uh, there's like really, there was a beautiful collaboration between Hans and, and Richard to, uh, so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't create car crashes on the, on the soundtrack, but really uh, kind of, uh, I love when there's no, you don't know exactly if you are hearing the sound design or the music and both are, uh, um, are married together. Uh, yeah, it was a, a nice journey to do the sound of this movie. Yeah, I mean, the synergy between the, all the aspect of the sound is incredible. Uh, but Hans was here when we showed Dune last time, and I saw the personality that you mentioned, which I'm sure on set is a little... Uh, I mean, it, it could be tricky. But it worked out really well. So. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, Hans, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the great uh, artistic... Uh, encounter uh, in my life. I mean, it's, uh, someone that uh, is, his relationship with creativity is phenomenal. I mean, it's like really, uh, absolutely, I learned so much with him. I also, I was wondering, because it's when you shared some carte blanche and the titles, uh, which is film that I've, I assume you've seen earlier in your, uh, as a film goer, but do you still have time to watch a lot of current or like newer director, new work, or is it like too much of a conflict? It, no, it depends with, on yeah, it depends yeah, it depends of the work. of the um, it depends on, on the when I shoot. Uh, of course, it's it, uh, it's totalitarian. I cannot uh, uh, watch movies, but uh, outside of that, I try to look at uh, as much movies. But I'm late. I mean, I cannot. There's so many films, and but I try. I try my best to watch as much movies as I can from trying to find movies from different part in the world yeah, as much as I can. Yeah. But in the cinema? As much as I can. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. I love, yeah. Yeah, I absolutely adore to watch movies in theaters. It's uh, still one of my greatest pleasures still today, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, I, I agree. You know, we, we were trying to find time for you to go in the Criterion closet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the reason is like you were supposed to pick DVDs for me. I didn't tell you. <laughs> I was going to give you a list of, okay, the that's films why, yeah. <laughs> of the films I wanted to to rewatch, and uh, so you have to you have to go next time when uh, we get you back. Uh, I would love to show uh, the 70 millimeter print of the film if it's ever possible. 
Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the movie was, uh, uh, as you all know, was uh, uh, delayed. It was supposed to be released in November, and there was a delay because of the strike. Uh, and uh, I agreed with that uh, uh, because we needed the actors for the marketing. And seeing what they are doing on the red carpet, um, I think <laughs> it's worth the wait. But you, you, uh, you need a lot of support yeah, yeah. for a big film. <laughs> yeah, the, I didn't, uh, didn't fit into the robot suit. But... Uh, <laughs> um, it gave me a, a Warner Brother uh, uh, gave me a gift for uh, to to help me to for the waiting the 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 uh, the idea to uh, to do 70 millimeter prints of the movie and and uh, IMAX 70 millimeter prints, uh, which is something I haven't done in years, and it's quite moving. There's something more raw about the image, and and but it's quite impressive to see the movie in film. And I'm very excited that uh, that was a beautiful gift. I'm very excited that uh, it's an experiment. And it's not an experiment. It's false, sorry. Someone else did it before. <laughs> I don't know if you heard about Oppenheimer. But uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, but it's really, uh, um, uh, yeah, I can't wait to, to see how people react. And I, I was absolutely, uh, when I saw the first print in IMAX, uh, uh, I was moved to tears. Seriously, how, how beautiful it is and, and uh, spectacular it looks on, on, a, on an IMAX screen. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be able to get you to come back and show uh, both uh, parts in 70 millimeter, not IMAX, but yeah. in print. Uh, and you are welcome to come back for part three if you don't kill Zendaya. <laughs> And any other film you're working on and writing, because uh, we're a big fan of your, of your films, and it was really great to have you back uh, here. I, I will say, I was, uh, Florence, I, Florence, it was like really uh, uh, a privilege and an honor for me that you, you invited me to uh, choose movies at Carte Blanche. It was a, a really an honor, and I, I, I wish I had sit here watching those movies. I was traveling around the world, but uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it was really, uh, thank you. It was a gift for me. Thank you. Thank you very much.